the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. Praise God. You ready for the word of God tonight? We're going to be talking about fighting the good fight. And um, most of the best messages that God um, gives into my life really come out of my own um, struggles. They come out of my own you know, wrestlings with God, uh, lessons that he teaches me. Um, If you learn something yourself, then you can pass it on to somebody else. I can read you a scripture and I can tell you what I think it may may, uh, mean. But if I've lived through something and I've discovered something from the word of God and I've discovered that reality, that gives me a whole different uh, dimension to be able to speak. And um, a few weeks back, I think maybe a month and a half, uh, Pastor Dan was preaching, and he preached on Luke chapter 4 about the temptation of Jesus. And it was a wonderful message about how the devil tempted Jesus. And, but there was one scripture he used at the end, which is uh, Luke 4.13. It's not going to be on the screen, but I'll just mention it, that after all the temptations had ended, or well, it says now uh, when the devil had ended every temptation... He departed from him until an opportune time. The Message Bible says the devil retreated temporarily, lying in wait for another opportunity. And I realize that all of us, from the time you give your heart to Jesus, and even before you give your heart to Jesus, you're under an assault, you're under a a tremendous battle throughout your life. And you're going to have to learn to fight. It's one of my favorite scriptures and one of my favorite characters in the Bible is David. And, um, you know, just he, 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 he prayed and he said, Lord, he said, blessed be the Lord my strength. This is Psalm 144 verse 1, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. There's one thing that you're going to have to learn as a believer. You're going to have to learn to fight. You know, September 11th was a tremendous tragedy in the country. But I heard today that because of September 11th, that the United States has now liberated 55 million people from dictators in the Middle East. And it very much was almost like a Pearl Harbor because, you know what, they didn't know who they were messing with. And America now has, has brought freedom to many, many parts of the world as a result of the attack that was brought against our shores. Because even as believers, even if the enemy comes in like a flood, God will raise up a standard against him. And God wants to teach us as Christians to fight. He wants us to learn to use the weapons that he's given us, um, and he wants us to learn to be fighters. He wants us to, to, to build the character of a warrior, I heard there's a great movie out called Warrior right now. I, uh, I've heard very good things about it. But God wants us as believers to be warriors. So 1 Timothy 6 verse 12, let's uh, just let's start there and, and we'll look at what Paul writes to Timothy. He says to him, fight the good fight of faith. He says to Timothy, fight the good fight. I don't know how a fight can always be a good fight. There's a lot of fights I go through as a believer, and I'm, I'm really trying to find the good part of the fight, because some of these fights are really, really tough. And he says, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life to which you were called, have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So the Bible says we're going to have to fight a good fight, and you've got to learn to fight it. And very often as Christians, we, we don't really understand what it means to fight. We're going to look at a few of the areas that we have to fight, but there's many of my friends and people that I know, and even in our own family, we've had to fight, um, uh, you know, some major, major battles over the past year. Um, and, uh, And so, you know, some of the fights are not easy. Some of the fights, you know, you you just want to just speak a word and make it go away. But you know what? Sometimes you're you know, six months later, you're, you're still warring. You're still dealing with a, a child that won't, you know, come into line with the Word of God. You're dealing with somebody's addiction who won't, you know, submit that to God. And there's a lot of areas that it's, that it's a good fight. I mean, it is a tough fight. 
and it's not an easy fight. So the classic scripture, Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to read just from the New King James. It's going to come up on the screen. Then I'm going to just do a little bit in the Message Bible so you get a gist of what Paul's saying. He's talking about the armor of God, and this is what he's saying to all Christians. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. It's a very important scripture. We'll come back to that. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, Above all, taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. He lists seven different weapons. We're not going to look at them all tonight. We're going to hone down just to three different principles tonight. But I want to, first of all, just give you the broad arsenal that God's given us as Christians that are at our disposal, that we need to know about, and hopefully this will sort of stimulate some personal study. In Ephesians 6, in the Message Bible, it's interesting how it says, just listen to how it says here. So take everything the Master has set out for you, well-made weapons of the best materials, and put them to use so you will be able to stand up to everything the devil throws your way. This is no afternoon athletic contest that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps, a life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. Be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get, every weapon God has issued, so that when it's all over, but the shouting, you will still be on your feet. Amen? 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 You know, sometimes we just sort of gloss over some of these things. This is a life and death battle. And it's a, it's a tremendous fight. And there's a lot of wiles of the enemy, and he throws up many of them against us. Some of the areas that are, I'm just going to just touch on in terms of people that I know that have had major, major, major fights and battles in these last, particularly one or two years, we often have a tremendous fight against our finances and our resources. It's a huge, huge warfare. It's a, it's a place where if the enemy wants to stop something, he goes after the funding of it. He goes after the source. And it can be in the family. It can be in a business. It can be in a, in a church. It can be in every area. There is often a targeted, massive assault against finances. And that is an area of battle that we're going to have to learn to fight. Number two, we have to fight against attacks against our health. And one of the things that I, over the last few weeks, had been really wrestling against a, a, uh, a, an upper respiratory infection. And just, you know, and it was like something normally you could just uh, maybe take an antibiotic or something. But this was a stubborn one. And it, it took a lot to be able to really come against it and to... And I, as I was going through it, this message kept coming into my heart that sometimes the fight for our health is a tremendous battle. And it's not an easy battle, and it's not, you know, you often don't know which way to go, and what do I do, God, and how do I, how do I uh, navigate this battle? The third area is against our relationships within the family and without the family. And you can have tremendous warfare going on on the home front. And sometimes, you know, certain, certain relational things just defy your thinking. You wonder why people make some decisions that they make, and you wonder what is behind their thinking. And, 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 and sometimes you're caught in the battle of your lives. There's two of my friends that have had tremendous attacks on, in the workplace, relationally, and had their jobs literally on the line right down to the you know, to the, to, the, to the very end and had to do a tremendous war to keep their jobs. And there's many, many people that have had to fight for their jobs. 
It wasn't just a question, oh, well, you know, God blessed me, so I'm just going to... The Bible says you have to fight. You have to learn to fight. And you have to learn to get the victory, and you've got to learn to overcome. And then mostly the last point is faith is always on the line. The Bible says, fight the good fight of faith. At the end of the, of the, of the picture, the devil's always after your faith. And, and, and all the battles that you face, he really has one target. Bring your faith down. So that if something doesn't work out exactly how you thought it was going to, or should have, or could have, you, you somehow have this picture of what, it, of what it should, the resolution should have come out to be, and you get disappointed, then the enemy sits on your shoulder and says, oh, well, God doesn't really care, and obviously, you know, he's not even there for you, and you're sure you're even saved. And I mean, he throws the, the, the kitchen sink at you. So... These are the four areas that, that I just, you know, I, I've seen tremendous assault in these last. I'm sure there are a hundred other areas you can take the same principles and apply to them. Amen? So that's the groundwork behind why we're going to talk about this tonight. And we're going to go very quickly through this because I'm going to focus only in on three principles. Now, as we were singing in the songs, the one thing we always have to remember... When you've given your heart to Jesus, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You've got to realize God lives in you. And God is on the inside. And so no matter what you know, battle that you're facing, it's, it's not the devil against you. It's the devil against God. Because Jesus dwells in you and you belong to him and he belongs to you. And you've got to understand that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Amen? Amen? Don't ever lose sight of that. But these are some of the weapons that God's given you. I'm just going to give you a broad overview. These aren't all of them. But this is the arsenal that you have to work with. We're not going to touch on all of them, but you can maybe do some research later. Maybe write them down. Number one, the blood of Jesus. Blood of Jesus is powerful. It breaks the power of sin. The blood of Jesus breaks every curse. The blood of Jesus gives you access to the throne of heaven. The blood of Jesus saves you. The blood of Jesus is with you. It is, it is the cleansing power of God. And the Bible says we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. And so one of our greatest weapons is the blood of Jesus and learning to understand the power of the blood of Jesus and learning how to use the blood of Jesus to bring protection. I'm not going to go into details with that, but I do have a message back there called Deliver Us From Evil. And this goes through the pattern that I use in my own ministry, in my own family, to pray for protection. Dealing with the blood of Jesus in some of these other areas, it's called Deliver Us. It's got a snake on the front, but don't let that scare you. It is an incredibly powerful message because as we touch all over the world, we're under massive assault all the time. And we have to learn to fight. We've got to learn to be warriors. So the blood of Jesus, number one. Number two, the authority and the name of Jesus Christ and the authority in his name that we have. So we need to learn to use the name of Jesus. The Bible says we've been given authority to use that name. We've been given authority to speak not on our own behalf, but we can speak to the enemy in the name of Jesus. In his authority, in his name. It's like an ambassador speaking on behalf of the United States. Except it's far greater power. But we have to learn to use the name of Jesus. We've been given that authority. We've been given that name. And we have to learn to use that weapon. Number three, the angels of God that are protecting us. We need to understand that they're there. We need to pray for them. We need to ask God for them. And we need to realize that they are sent forth from heaven to minister on our behalf. They're sent forth to minister to us. They're sent forth to minister alongside us. And the angels of God are always there. And we can pray for those angels to be dispatched. And it's part of my daily prayer is that God would just send forth his angels and he would mobilize them on my behalf. I ask for all kinds. I say, God, I want warring angels. I want ministering angels. I want, I want, you know, every kind of angel you can send forth that can help. Just send them. We need to have them. Got to realize we need them. 
We need all the weapons God's given us. Amen? Amen. Number four, prayer. Not going to go into a lot of details on that, but just the fact that the power of prayer is an incredible, incredible power. Both the praying in another in an unknown uh, language that God's given us through the Holy Spirit, as well as our tangible, natural prayers. But prayer, every time you come before God, I mean, it, it unleashes power. And the prayer that God gives us is a tremendous weapon that we have against the enemy. And we need to use it every single day. You cannot let down the prayer, God. I'm just, you know, privileged that I have a wife that does multiple fasts and prayer. And that even adds a whole nother dimension. The reason why our ministry has often been able to make the strides it has, it hasn't just come because we just showed up. There has been a lot of fr- price to pay. And I just thank God that, that Lisa's been given that tremendous ability many times to go into even up to 40-day fast to, to bring to birth the things that God wants in prayer. And there's times in the Bible where people will pray for three weeks before God will be able to break through. God will actually send the answer the first day they pray. But there's a war going on in the heavenlies and there's often very much an interference for something to get through. But we're grateful in the New Testament that we have access by the Holy Spirit, by the blood of Jesus. We have a different access than they had in the Old Testament. And we have an ability to hear His voice that they didn't have back then. But prayer is a tremendous, tremendous help. Now, number five, we're going to go into, this is one of the three, the power of His Word, the sword of the Spirit. And I'm not necessarily talking about just the Scriptures, but I'm talking about a word that comes in season. A word, when Jesus was confronted with temptation, He said, it is written, and He spoke a specific word. It was a sword that went out of His mouth that dealt specifically with what was needed. And as we've confronted and we have to face and fight... We need to learn to hear that specific word from God that pertains to our situation. I will touch on that in a moment. Number six, the word of our testimony. If God has delivered you from something, if He's given you, if you've been delivered from an addiction, if you've been through something and you have come through it and God has given you a testimony, that testimony will overcome the enemy. It's a weapon. And you can find another drug addict. If you were a drug addict and you can say, I know what you're going through. I was there and I'm going to share my testimony with you. Your testimony will set them free. You've got to realize that testimony becomes a weapon that God can use to help you. Now, number seven is the second one we're going to talk about tonight specifically. Practical acts. Practical acts. And we'll get to those in a moment. And number eight is the third one, being willing to stand and never give up. The Bible says, having done all, stand. And we're going to talk about that attitude. We're going to talk about what the people on Flight 93, you know, they took a stand. People on Flight 93, they, they gave up their lives so that they could save others. They didn't love their lives unto death. And we'll talk about that whole area. So the three areas we're going to talk about is the word, practical acts, and being willing to stand and never give up. The last two are just very much is the rest of the armor of God and the corporate power of others praying and standing with you. You need to actually mobilize more than yourself praying for yourself. My wife has a whole Facebook following And she can put out wherever we are in the world and say, we need prayer for this. And we'll have 80 to 100 people from around the world instantly praying. And we need to build those type of communities. We need to have friends and we need to have people around us. We can put out prayer alerts because one shall chase 1,000, two shall chase 10,000. So we need to learn the power of corporate prayer. In our ministry, we have seven prayer meetings a week. They're at least a half hour long each. Seven a week. And we'll have more if we need them. But it's, we realize that the power of corporate prayer was going to be the engine that was going to drive the ministry and we could not stop, we could not give up. And I pay them to pray. It costs me a fortune every month to pay my staff to pray. And then when they come in, I say, you are being paid right now to pray. 
That's a pretty good, pretty good uh, uh, salary to go to be paid to, to do something like that that's spiritual. But you know what? It's worthwhile because the power of corporate prayer is a tremendous weapon. And when you come together and you're in unity and you begin to storm the gates of hell and you begin to pray against and you begin to stand with the people that are going through things and start praying for your different people that are connected with you, it unleashes tremendous power. And we need all of these. Amen? Amen. All right. The rest of the armor of God, I want to touch on things. This is going to ruffle maybe a few feathers here. But many, many people... You know, they, they, they do the confession on their, on the, um, that we do every single week and, on, on concerning finances. And they say, well, God, it's not working for me. Well, the confession only works if Jesus is Lord of your finances. There's only one indication that He's Lord of your finances is that you honor Him with the first tenth. Because there's a principle in the scriptures that if the first tenth belongs to him and you honor him with that, the entire rest of it comes under a divine protection. And it comes under a divine provision. Now you can scream at the devil and bind him and do everything else. And if, you, if, he, if Jesus is not Lord over that fine, of those finances, it's not going to make any difference. It's not going to help you. The moment that you give the first tenth to God... The Bible says God rebukes the devourer on your behalf. He puts a shield of protection around your resources. And the Bible says He opens up the windows of heaven and pours out blessing into your midst and brings about everything that we confess there now opens up a conduit for that to come into your life. And so, so many times we're binding the wrong thing. All we have to do is put, put the tithe into the, into the offering and put the tithe into the giving and suddenly all of that stuff unfolds and it happens. And that's why the weapons of the warfare, the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness, these are vital parts of the weapons of God. Because if truth is the truth of His Lordship over your finances. These are just some principles. We're not going to go into detail on them, but I would throwing that in for two, two cents. If you have, have trouble in your finances, I just challenge you to make Jesus completely Lord over the whole lot by just giving your tithe to Him. And you will see something change. Even though in the natural it doesn't make sense, it does work in the spiritual. Amen? All right, praise God. We're going to touch on these three quickly right now. Number one, getting a rhema word from God or getting a specific word from God. Now, I've given you all kinds of an arsenal of different things that God can use to bring about, you know, uh, victory in your battles. But these three are, to me, these are three principles that are tremendously powerful, and they're kind of like you can hang the rest around on them. This first one is getting a rainbow word from God is getting a specific word from the Lord when you start facing a battle, you have to say, God, what is going on? And I need to hear from you. Because you can go a thousand different directions. It can be a symptom in your body. It can be, you know, something that's coming against you with your family. But you have to get a rhema. And, you know, we just put our oldest daughter into law school. And what a procedure it is to get a kid into law school. I mean, it's a procedure for them and it's a procedure for the parents. But my daughter has had it in her heart to go to law school for years and years and years. I have, I'm awed at the amount of effort and work and everything that this girl put into it. She took off six months and she studied day and night to pass the LSAT, which is the law exam that is a huge basis of the admission process. And you know what? She took the exam, and when she got it back, she got her result back, it was an okay grade, but it was not the grade that she was after because she studied to be able to get into one of the top, top schools in the country. And she was just, she fell apart. 
And it was a tremendous battle. She literally was about to throw away her dreams, throw away her future. And, and I didn't, as a father, I'm like, you know, I didn't know what to say. I didn't, I didn't know how to handle it. I didn't know how. She's like, I don't have a plan B, Dad. But you know what? I'm just going to find something else to do with my life. And here I've watched this girl for five years prepare herself. And I was distraught as a parent. And I, I just prayed that night as I was going, going to bed. And the Holy Spirit just gave me one short little word. And the Lord said, go and tell her, it's not what you wanted, but it is what you need. And I went into her room. I said, Christina, I just have a word from the Lord for you. I said, this, this result is not what you wanted, but it is what you need. And I let it go with that. And you know that one word from God just turned the, t- turned the tide. Yeah. And she began to get uh, a, a fee waivers from the schools asking her to apply. She had a tremendous personal statement. And she ended up getting into Temple Law School, number 61 in the nation, one of the top schools in the country. And she just started there about three weeks ago. But it's, it hinged upon a one word from God. They could have taken her and she could have abandoned her dreams or gone on with her destiny. And those battles are very, very real sometimes if you as a parent know what it is to face them. It can be any type of decision that your kids go through. But you need to get that just, just a simple word from heaven. Sometimes when it comes to losing a job. I worked for four and a half years for Reinhardt. After four and a half years, he said to me, he said, you know... You need to go on and do what God's called you to do. Basically, you're fired. And it was a, you know, Lisa was pregnant with our second child. I was going through Fuller Seminary at the time. I had no other source of income. I mean, I was devastated. And I was just so troubled. I said, God, what did I do wrong? And, you know, your world just begins to spin. And I had booked, I was let go on a Friday, and I had booked a Sunday service to preach up in Corning, up in Northern California, north of Sacramento. And I said, I'm going to go and honor this commitment because I gave my word. I'm not going to say a word to them what I'm, what's happening, and I'm just going to go there, bless his ministry, and I'll, and I'll figure out later what to do. I drove up there depressed. I don't know how many, eight, nine, ten hours with... One daughter is about two years old and, and Lisa pregnant, trying to figure out how I was going to pay for everything, how I was going to even take care of the family. And we get up there and I preach this morning service and that evening a lady came over and said, well, my grandmother wants you to come and preach at their church tonight. I figured I've come 11 hours to come up here and preach. I might as well go and do the service. I go into a little old Pentecostal church in Red, it's not in Reading, but in a place called Red Bluff. And there's about 12 uh, ladies who are over 80 years old. And there's a handful of other people in the church. I mean, a tiny little congregation. And I preached my heart out. I didn't say a word about what had happened. At the end of the service, the lady who was the leader, Sister Confidence Close, I didn't realize that she was a mighty woman of God. And she called Lisa and I forward. And she began to prophesy. She began to speak about our calling to Africa. She began to speak about what God was going to do in our lives. And at the end of this prophecy, God just spoke a word to us and said, I've not called you to stand in another man's shadow. I've given you a ministry in your own right. And then I knew a word from God. The break with Reinhardt was from the Holy Spirit. And I knew that God had given us a ministry. And we started Good Shepherd Ministries based on that word. Amen? one word from heaven that rhema word that, that, that something that comes to you that speaks and cuts through all of the stuff and it's just a lifeline that God throws you in the middle of a battle is critical you've got to learn to get those I'm just going to close this thing by just speaking about how David heard, listened to God 2 Samuel 5 17 says when the Philistines heard now David was a mighty warrior. Everybody agree? And David had a certain pattern of how he listened to God. David would actually ask a lot of true-false questions. He was like, 
God, should I do this? Yes. Okay, should I do this? No. I mean, he would ask God yes and no questions. Sometimes it's easier to hear a yes and a no than it is to hear some complicated sentence. Amen? So listen to what 2 Samuel 5, 17, it says, Now when the Philistines heard they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. The Philistines also went and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? The Lord said to David, Go up, I'll I'll doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hands. So David went to Baal Perazim and David defeated them there. All right. He just asked a true or false. He went up there. Okay, God, do I go up against them? Will you deliver them? Yes, I will. Okay, that's all I need to hear. Sometimes God will give you just a yes, no direction. Sometimes the solution to your battle is not going to come in one sentence, one big word from the Lord. Sometimes God will just give you the word for today. What you need to do today to win today's part of the battle. Because you may not get the whole picture, because you may not be able to handle the whole picture. So you need to just learn what is sufficient for today. Now, this is just five verses later, the Philistines come up again. The word that God gave David a few days before doesn't work this time. And David has to ask God, and again, what do I do next? So this is in 2 Samuel 5, 22. Then the Philistines went up once again, deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Same place, same Philistines. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, and he said, And God says, You shall not go up. Circle around behind them and come upon them in front of the mulberry trees. Then you shall advance quickly. Then the Lord will go before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. And David did so. As the Lord commanded him, he drove back the Philistines from Geba to as far as Gezer. Yesterday's instruction is not necessarily today's instruction. Amen? So he said, God, do I go up? Yes, you go up and do it. Next time he said, sorry, go up. Don't go up this way now. Go around the back. And sometimes God's going to give you different instructions day by day. As you fight a battle and you come against the enemies that are going to come against you, what you do today is not necessarily what you'll do tomorrow. Amen? And you have to keep open to here. Amen? Oh, anybody get anything from this tonight? We're going to cover these last two very quickly here. Practical acts. Now, it's great to hear a word from the Lord, and you need to have that. But let me tell you, sometimes we get so spiritual as Christians, we're just no earthly good. To me, there's not this big differentiation between the spiritual and the natural. To me, we're all fighting the same battle. When I pray for somebody who's sick, I'm fighting the same battle that the doctor's fighting to try and get rid of that sickness. And there's a bunch of other areas that we can help to help get rid of that sickness. It's not a question of one or the other. It is a question, though, of where your trust is. Your trust has got to be fully in God. But then to me, the rest of it, you can just throw the kitchen sink at it. Because once you've got a word from God, now you have to step in and do everything you can practically. Do you know it's just as spiritual when we're facing a huge need as a ministry and we need to reach out to a country or do a translation and we pray and we fast and we seek God and it's wonderful and God moves in the spiritual realm and we have an open door. But let me tell you, a businessman who comes in and writes a check for $1,000 and says, here's to do that language, that's spiritual warfare as much as the prayer was in the fasting. A practical act of giving can sometimes be the answer and the solution that's needed in a situation. And so often we look at, oh, well, it's not really that spiritual. It is spiritual. Giving is spiritual. And so in many, many of these areas, so here we have a situation with uh, King Asa. 2 Chronicles 16, 12. This is a king that trusted God and that made great advances. 
And the Bible says in the 39th year of his reign, so he trusted God against a million man army and he defeated this army. But in 2 Chronicles 16, 12, in the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in his feet. His malady was severe. Yet in his disease he did not seek the Lord, but only the physicians. He sought the physicians, but not God. It's not that we shouldn't seek the physicians, but we should seek God first. Amen? God may use the physicians. God may do a supernatural act. Amen. Now, I'm just going to give you some practical things that can, that, that can help you in your health. I remember a number of years ago reading about Dr. Lorraine Day, who had terminal, what do you call, what's it, stage four cancer, breast cancer. She was a medical doctor and she was the head of general surgery at uh, San Francisco General Hospital at the height of the AIDS crisis. She knew enough about medicine that she knew that she was in stage four, that even all the chemo and everything else that she could have gone through at that particular stage would not work for her. And so she actually went and she sought God and God showed her ten things, practical things, that cost nothing. Now, all the pharmaceutical companies hate this woman. But these are the things that God showed her are a part of getting healthy and a part of getting back to health. Number one is nutrition. Tremendous, where she goes into juicing or whatever she does, but nutrition and good nutrition is critical to the thing. And you have to buy food anyway, so you might as well buy good food. Number two, exercise. Number three, water. Lots of water. Number four, sunlight. Just being exposed to sunlight in a healthy type of dimension, not lying on the beach for eight hours, but we're talking about a healthy exposure to sunlight, is very healthy to the body. Number five, she called temperance or abstinence. This has nothing to do with sexual abstinence. This was all to do with abstinence from, you know, smoking, drinking, caffeine, certain types of substances that are damaging to your body. So she just backed off on those things. Number six, fresh air. Number seven, rest and sleep and getting a good, you know, Sabbath going in your life. Number eight, faith. They figured out people with faith last longer in hospitals than people who don't have faith. Number nine, an attitude of gratitude. She found people who had a gratitude attitude, they got better quickly and that helped them. And number 10, benevolence. When you actually reach out and help somebody else, and the Bible in Isaiah 58 actually talks about, is not this the fast that I think that you loose the bonds of people? You can just think in Isaiah 58, 6, we're not going to read it, but it's there. You can write it down and you can see that God says that if you do this, He says your healing, the last verse, your healing shall spring forth speedily. Ten practical things that can help bring health to your body. And they don't cost anything. And we as Christians, I'm just giving this as an example, but there are many areas in our lives. You know, when I began to go through this respiratory thing, I'm like, okay, Lord, what do I do? Begin to research on the internet. And I began to, you know, um, change my diet. I began to change a number of different things. Practical areas to help bring about health. And we all need to look at those. Amen? Finally, you need to have a willingness to stand and never give up. This is an attitude issue. The Bible says, having done all, you stand. At the end of the day, you want to be able to fight. But I think it was Kenneth Hagin who said, if you're willing to stand forever, you won't have to stand long. If you're willing to stand forever, you won't have to stand long. You see, when the enemy knows that you're not going to quit, and you know what, if something this doesn't work, you know, you're going to try four other things. You're going to pull out whatever other weapon you can find. I mean, you're going to fight until you win this battle. And when you have an attitude that I'm going to be a warrior, and I may not win on the first day, but I may win on the fifth day, I may win after six months, 
but I'm going to fight until this battle is won. Amen? That is going to get you the victory. Revelation 12, 11. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony. They didn't love their lives unto death. I talked about flight 93. They didn't love their lives unto death. They gave up their lives so that they could save other people. When, when a person is so committed to do the right thing and to fight until the end that they don't really, really care about their own life. I'm going to close with this illustration. This is from the tit story of the Titanic, and I believe this person is the true, um, what can I say, the true hero of the Titanic. It's a man by the name of John Harper. And this guy, to me, epitomizes somebody who had this attitude that, as the Bible talks about, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and that they love not their lives unto death. We often like the first two. We don't like that third one too much. Because that third one means, look, I'm going to do whatever it takes to do the will of God in my life. And I don't care what it's going to cost me, even the ultimate price. But I'm going to obey God rather than man. When you have that attitude, when you having done all that you know how, you say, devil, I'm going to stand. And I'm not quitting, and I'm not backing down, and I'm not letting go. But I am going to stand, and I'm going to hold on until the victory manifests. Now, this man, John Harper, was born to a pair of solid Christian parents on May... 29th, 1872. It was on the last Sunday of March, 1886, when he was 13 years old that he received Jesus as the Lord of his life. He didn't know what it was like to sow his wild oats because he began to preach about four years later at the ripe old age of 17 years old. He went down to the streets of his village and poured out his soul in earnest entreaty for men to be reconciled to God. From the age of 17, he was preaching. He started his own church in September of 1896. He started with 25 members, and the next 13 years it grew to 500 members, which is a lot of people in those days. And during this time he got married, but he was widowed shortly thereafter. However brief the marriage, God did bless John Harper with a beautiful little girl named Nana. Now, on the night of April 14, 1912, he was on the Titanic. The RMS Titanic sailed swiftly on the bitterly cold ocean waters, heading unknowingly into the pages of history. On board the ship that night were John Harper and his much-beloved six-year-old daughter, Nana. According to the document reports, as soon as it was apparent the ship was going to sink, John Harper immediately took his daughter to a lifeboat. It's reasonable to assume that his widowed preacher could have easily gotten on board this boat to safety. However, it never seemed to have crossed his mind. He bent down, kissed his precious little girl. Looking into her eyes, he told her that she would see him again someday. The flares going off in the dark sky above reflected the tears on his face as he turned and headed towards the crowd of desperate humanity, still on the sinking ocean liner. As the rear of the huge ship began to lurch upwards, it was reported that Harper was seen making his way up the deck, yelling, Woman, children, and unsaved into the lifeboats. It was only minutes later the Titanic began to rumble deep within. Most people thought it was an explosion. Actually, the gigantuan ship was literally breaking in half. At this point, many people jumped off the decks into the icy dark waters below. John Harper was one of these people. That night, 1,528 people went into the frigid waters. John Harper was swimming frantically to people in the water leading them to Jesus before hypothermia became fatal. Mr. Harper swam up to one young man who had climbed up on a piece of debris. Reverend Harper asked him between breaths, Are you saved? The young man replied he was not. Harper then tried to lead him to Christ, only to have the young man who was near shock reply, No. John Harper took off his life jacket and threw it to the man and said, Here then, you need this more than I do, and swam away to other people. A few minutes later, Harper swam back to the young man and succeeded in leading him to salvation. Of the 1,528 people that went into the water that night, 
only six were rescued by lifeboats. One of them was this young man on the debris. Four years later at a survivor's meeting, this young man stood up and in tears recounted how that after John Harper led him to Christ, Mr. Harper tried to swim back to help other people because of the intense cold had grown too weak to swim. His last words before going under the frigid waters, believe on the, on the name of the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Amen. Amen. That man epitomizes to me a person who loved not his life. He says, the guy said, I'm not going to accept Jesus. He said, take here's my life. You need him more than I do. Because he knew where he was going. And that man was one of six people that got saved that night. He got saved spiritually, but he also got saved physically. And so, as we come, as we face battles in our lives, obviously this is just a brief summary. I believe that God wants to give us every arsenal we can get at our disposal. He wants us to seek a word from Him. He wants us to get practical in what we do in terms of fighting a situation. And number three, He wants us to have an attitude that we will never quit until we see a victory and we're not going to give up in Jesus' name. God bless you. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. I don't think we need much more um, prompting than the story of John Harper as he went from person to person. As they were in the frigid waters, talked about 9-11, and we talked about this morning about, you know, the people that, that woke up that morning 10 years ago, they didn't have a clue that that was their last day on the planet. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. We're not guaranteed that we're going to have this long, wonderful life. The Bible says today's the day of salvation. Today's the day that a person has to make that decision. And it's not a question of just, oh, well, I, you know, God, I want you to be one part of my life. Just, it, it, it has to come a place in your life as a, as, as a person to say, Jesus, I want to give all of my heart and all of my life to you. I grew up in an Anglican church, and I grew up in a church where I went to church six times a week for about 10 years. And I didn't know that I wasn't saved, but I wasn't. So I was, I was going through the motions, saying all the words, singing the hymns, doing all of that. But the Bible says that it's not a question of going through the motions or coming to church or being a good person. None of those things will get us into heaven. A person has to be born again, the Bible says. They have to give heart and soul. And when I realized when I was 12 years old, a person got into this church and began to preach about getting born again, and I was just a little 12-year-old kid in the, in the pews, and they didn't even have an altar call like we're having tonight. There was not even a real major opportunity, but he simply prayed a prayer, and my heart believed. And I embraced what Jesus did for me on the cross. I said, God, I need salvation, and I need forgiveness. And I... I believe what you did on the cross was for my sin and for my salvation. And I embrace Jesus as the Lord and Savior of my life. And I just prayed that to myself, between myself and God. And I walked out in the night when I was in South Africa at this time, just a 12-year-old kid, and there was hardly anybody else saved in the entire church and the entire school that I was attending was a church school. I turned to one of the only other Christians in the school and I said, I do not know what just happened to me. I said, but something has changed on the inside of me. And he looked at me and he says, you just got born again. You see, I went from just having a mental ascent to what I had been going through the motions doing to embracing a full faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for me on the cross. And that is from that day to this day, I've known Jesus as my Savior, my Lord. I want to give a chance for every person here tonight if you've never made Jesus fully Lord of your life, if you were in the frigid waters of the Titanic and there on the ocean and, and John Harper came up to you and said, are you saved? And do you know that you're saved? And do you know that without a shadow of a doubt that if you were to die tonight that you would make heaven? If you don't know that, you can make sure tonight. And so I'm going to give you all a chance. Anybody who needs to make that decision tonight, you can all come to a faith in Jesus Christ. I want all, of, all our eyes just to be closed for a moment. I know we don't normally do it like this, but I'm going to do it like this tonight. I want to ask this question. If you need to make things right between you and God tonight, wherever you are, just raise up your hand just so I can see it. 
I want you just to raise up your hand if you need to give your heart to Jesus tonight. I see a hand back there. I'm probably going to need my glasses. Anybody else that needs to give their heart to Jesus tonight? If you want to make sure that you're saved and that you want to make sure that if you were to die tonight, you'd make heaven, just raise up your hand just so I can see it. I see the hand there. Anybody else? Yes, I see a hand back there. I see another hand back there. I see one at the very back over there. Okay, anybody else that needs to make that decision? You need to make your life right before, between you and God tonight. Anybody else? This is between you and Jesus. Anybody else? I see a hand right back there. I got you, sir. Anybody else that needs to make that decision tonight? Just raise up your hand. Indicate that you would like to do, you would like to make Jesus Lord of your life tonight. Just raise up your hand. Anybody else? It's between you and God. You may not have tomorrow. You may not have another chance. Did you raise your hand? Just raise up your hand again. Did you raise your hand over there? Anybody else? All right, two more people over there. Anybody else that needs to make that decision? I see your hands. You can put them down. Anybody else? I was just 12 years old when I gave my heart. I see another hand over here. Yes, I see your hand. God bless you. Anybody else that needs to do that? Guys, this is life and death. Life and death decisions. When you give your life to Jesus, everything will change. The greater one will come on the inside. God will come to live in, the, in, the, in your heart and will change your future. You can't fight the battle in this world by yourself. If you've got Jesus in your heart and you've got him as Lord of your life, he's going to fight for you on your behalf. Anybody else that needs to make that decision? Amen. I'm just going to ask you all to stand in the presence of God. All stand in the presence of God. And I'm going to ask those people to, to do something that's a, a, a bold move to do, but I would like the privilege of praying for you personally up front here. I'd like if you would just step into the aisles, grab a hold of your coat, your sweater, your Bible, bring a friend if you need to bring a friend. If you can just let them step into the aisle. If those people that get to raise their hands, if you can take a step of faith now and say, I'm going to give my heart tonight to Jesus, just step down and come in. Even if you're just doing it to reconfirm what you once did before or you're doing it for the first time, why don't you step into the aisles? Let's give them a hand as they come down and come and let's meet me up front. Let's pray together. It's changed the destinies here. God bless you. God bless you. And if you didn't raise your hand, but you still have a chance to do it, God bless you. Hey, God bless you. Well done. God bless you. God bless you. Hey, God bless you. Hey, blessings you. God bless you. Well done. God bless you. Hey, God bless you. God bless you. Okay, they're still coming. Give them a hand. Come on, change your destiny tonight. This is the first step towards victory in your future. The very first step is to give your heart to Jesus. Make him Lord. All right, God bless you. God bless you. Hey, if we put a smile on your face. It's the best decision. Since I was 12 to now, I've never regretted a day. I gave my heart to Jesus. You bow your heads. Let's all pray this together. Say, Dear Jesus, thank you that you love me. I believe that you are the Son of God, that you came to this earth as a man. You went to a cross. You died a horrible death. And you paid the price for my sins and for my salvation. I believe you rose from the dead. You're alive right now. And you're right here in this place. I ask you, Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive my past. Wash it with your blood. Be my Lord and be my Savior. From this day forward, help me to serve you. Help me to love you. Be Lord of my life. And I give my future into your hands. Let my heart be born again by your Holy Spirit. I receive you now as my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Give the Lord a hand, amen. God bless you. Best decision you ever made. I want you to turn to your left and to my right over here.
Pastor Dave, they actually voted in the friendliest pastor on staff. All right. Pastor Dave is going to just do uh, two other things he'll do with you. Give you some free literature and open up a program called the SPTs that we have here at The Rock. It's an optional program. I encourage you to take advantage of it. But it'll just take two minutes. Your friends and family will wait. If you can turn to your left and just follow Pastor Dave, and uh, he'll give you some free literature and some information. God bless you. Amen.